simple, I'll just say that this is a very broad topic and uh, I'm, I'm by no means expert in all of the bits that I'm going to talk about. Um, well, I'm, I'm a physicist, I, uh, well, I'm an astronomer, as David said, but uh, these days I also do research by applying um, uh, imaging techniques from astronomy to look, uh, looking at art. So, uh, to help with art conservation, archaeology, and art, art history. So that's uh, my current research area. It's by doing so that I first discovered um, the whole uh, area of color science. Um, the normal training of physicists does not tend not to include much about color science at all. So the first time I learned this is when I moved into um, helping the art world. And that's when I first uh, heard about uh, all the details of color science. Um, okay, so the first one was Goethe, so let's have a quick uh, uh, look at his, um, well, you all know probably some of these things, so I, I just flagged out a few things. He was born in the mid-18th um, century, and um, by the age of 25 he was very famous already um, because of his um, uh, novel, The Sorrow of Young Goethe, and uh, that he had instant fame uh, at a very young age. And after that, he did a number of other things, of course, in, in the you all know him for being a, a poet, a writer, uh, but he had also done some scientific work. Uh, as people in those, those days, they were um, polymaths, they did all kinds of things. So his first trip to Italy was to, uh, around the 1780s, and um, um, uh, during that period, he studied plants, and by the end of, uh, by the time he returned to uh, uh, Wimmer, he had uh, written a, 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 a book on uh, metamorphosis of plants and then uh, his other scientific work, which uh, is a topic of this uh, talk, is his theory of color. Uh, he, he, had, um, uh, he said that he was most proud of that piece of work. And of course, uh, he continued with his literary work, um, you know, about Faust. And uh, he also did some other things, uh, like um, uh, monitoring um, uh, using the uh, barometer. And he lived a long life, which is partly why he was so, had the time to do all this work. So he died at the age of 82. So in particular, we'll look at what he did for color. So when he was on his trip in Italy, he got very interested in art, as many of them did. It seems that whenever I look at all these uh, prominent people, every time they go to Italy, they suddenly cultivate their interest in art. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. So, uh, uh, as we do these days as well. And uh, so he, um, he got interested. I mean, by the way, he was also a painter and he was very good at drawing as well. And so he started investigating the principles governing the um, artistic use of color uh, to perhaps help in painting and help his observations of uh, these great paintings that he has seen in Italy. So that's how he got into colour. Um, it's because of his, his interest in art. And uh, then, he, uh, when he got back, he, uh, he thought, well, um, how, how am I going to understand more and find out the underlying principles behind uh, uh, painting in colour? And uh, he, then he thought he should really consult the physical science. And that's when he consulted uh, Newton's um, work on this and performed his first experiment using a prism in 1790. And then in the next two years, he published two contributions to optics. And, uh, and then later on, in 1810, he published his very important thesis theory of color. I have to admit that I never read this properly until I had to I had to prepare for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, um, this was actually a good opportunity for me to do so. Uh, we always know that uh, you know, I was new, like anybody who studied uh, no, color science at all, would, would know that Goethe had, um, um, had a different theory, and he argued with Newton, and so on. Um, and he had a different approach, that's all, you know. That, that that's what people would know about, but to actually go back to original sources and read it is a different matter. Well, I have to say I couldn't read the original sources because I don't read German. <laughs> so this was the um, um, translation by Charles Eastlake, um, 
in the 19th century. Uh, that is a publication that you can get anywhere, even that is not aware. And uh, um, Charles Eastlake uh, uh, was, of course, the, f um, the um, director of the National Gallery in the 19th century. And I, I guess, you know, I bought this book uh, um, when, I was, uh, the, uh, when I was briefly working in the National Gallery uh, around 10 years ago. Uh, but I never really got into reading it properly until now. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, start with uh, this whole business of the debate. Uh, between Goethe and Newton, not a not really debate face, face to face, of course. Um, so let's have a look, first of all, on Newton's famous experiment on white light and color. Newton was the first one who discovered that white light is decomposed into different colors. So his famous experiment was light comes in, goes through a prism, and then it's dispersed into different uh, uh, spectral bands because the reflective index <coughs> of red light is different from that of blue light, and so on. And so that, that's why they will get, it, uh, when they're projected on the, on the screen, you'll see different bands of color. Something looking like this, um, but uh, not quite in such detail. This is much higher resolution than what Newton would have seen. This is actually what Fraunhofer saw uh, much later. Um, in the, in the, um, and, uh, <laughs> Because when Newton did this, he did not have as good spectral resolution to, to notice the dark lines in the solar spectrum of daylight dispersed by prediction. And uh, so that was the story. And that led Newton to believe that white light is composed of components of different colored lights. And uh, so, of course, Goethe had uh, seen this work. And uh, he started to examine what's happening. And this is what he said. These experimental observations that we back what today's undergrad would write in their logbook, what they saw. So he said, how astonished I was then when the white wall observed through the prism note remained white just as before, that only there where darkness adjoined on it did a more or less de uh, determinate color appear. Finally, uh, that the window bars appeared in the liveliest color of all, <laughs> whereas no trace of color was to be seen in the light gray sky outside. Okay, this is all going because the camera is obscure as well. You know. <laughs> it did not take much delivery for me to recognize that a boundary is necessary to produce colors, and I immediately said to myself, as if by instinct, that the Newtonians, that Newtonian teaching is false. So, what we, uh, uh, so you, in fact, it was interesting reading one of the uh, other books that uh, there was somebody um, uh, in the 1980s had written a thesis particularly about the whole thing of uh, why Goethe was so much against Newton and so on. He looked at all the original sources and talked about it. And he said, one of the problems with this is misunderstanding. That Goethe did not understand that Newton did not look through the prism, but let but was looking at the light projected onto the screen, the wall, the white wall here. Um, so in fact, uh, some of the observations, if you, um, if you imagine light, white light was coming in here, dispersed into different components of light, and then in, imagine that you can also look in roughly the same direction, what you would get is the reversal of the beams are back into here to give you white light again. So what you will see along the line of sight is white light. And then the other thing that uh, Goethe had referred to, which I can't give you the, the, the full uh, chapter he was talking about essentially, was that if you have painted part of the wall black, and then if you look this way, then because uh, this bit is, you know, the, 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 the violet light would, be, would not be able to come back again because it's all black, that you would start to see some color toward the edge where the lightness and darkness are drawn. And uh, now, Goethe had always saw that color has something to do with the interaction between light and dark, uh, lightness and darkness. And so that sort of <coughs> affirmed his, his belief in that thing. Um, so in fact, um, as a physicist, you can explain what Goethe had seen. So there's nothing wrong with what Newton's theory uh, said. Okay, that might be the end of the lecture. Goethe is wrong. Newton's right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> what can a poet say to, to, to a mathematician physicist, right? But um, however, color theory, color science is much more complicated than that. 
Now, in the following part, what I'm going to just say a few things about a very rudimentary introduction to uh, color science as we understand it today. So, our eyes have uh, uh, three types of cones that's roughly um, uh, correspond, uh, responsive to blue light, green light, and red light. And, but in fact, it's not as simple as that. Um, you have these three types of cones, and what I'm drawing here is the response of uh, the blue cones, if you like, as a function of wavelengths. So this, is, um, this part is um, uh, uh, close to ultraviolet, and uh, this will be the center of the blue band, and so on, as you can see from the colors. And the green cone is responsive like that. So it's most sensitive around here. And for the blue one, it's most sensitive around uh, this uh, 440 nanometer wavelength. And the red one is a bit further beyond and it covers the red part of the spectrum. So you have three, so we all have three types of cones responsive, uh, uh, that's sensitive to, uh, simply put, blue, green, and red light. And now what happened, uh, okay, and these are the actual measurements uh, that people have done, for example, for a 22-year-old, what the three cones would do compared to somebody who's 72 years old. It seems that by the time when you age, the red cone response tends to go towards the red. This becomes maybe a little bit more yellow for you as you age. But this is healthy people's um, uh, vision, something uh, like that. And now, um, color size done by uh, the physical scientists. And uh, this is the part that I can say that I worked as a professional, but not the other part of color science. Okay. So normally what happens is that, for instance, um, I'm looking around, David's wearing a uh, t-shirt that's sort of burgundy-ish. Uh, and uh, so what's happening here is that the material uh, has a certain response to light. So this is a spectrum of uh, this patch, which looks burgundy-ish. So the spe spectral response of it. It means that it doesn't reflect much light in the blue part, the green part, but it, it reflects a lot more light in the red part of the spectrum. Okay. So the material absorbs certain components of the light and reflects the other component. But that's not the only thing. It's not just the material that gives you color. It's a light. You can shine, for example, uh, white light on it, so given by the blue curve, that's a daylight spectrum, okay? And then the other thing is our cone response. So these are what's called color matching functions, um, which is mathematical functions that uh, represent uh, the three cones we have that would give you the fudge factor to get the right color, okay? Um, they are not exactly what I've, I've shown you before. These are the measurements of the spectral response of the three types of cones. So this is a these are mathematical functions for you to calculate color from uh, the spectrum of the light and the um, uh, reflectance properties and absorption and uh, reflection properties of the material. So the three factors together will give you this color. So yeah, for example, for the ones who know a little bit of mathematics, that will be uh, this function multiplied by this function multiplied by, for example, the blue cone first, the blue uh, blue curve, and then you add up all the wavelengths components. That will give you the blue response. And then if you do the same, but for the green cone, you'll get another number, and then do the same for the red cone, you get yet another number. So you have the three numbers, which I can tell my monitor to display, and I get this color. Okay? So um, similarly for the green, you, you, you get the same. So if you change, for example, the lighting conditions, you get a different color. Um, if you change the material, of course, you get a different color. And if you have somebody colorblind, you see a different color as well. So it depends on the three things. And uh, um, the relation, you have to relate to astronomy, right? Because uh, this is a phenomenal event. So um, um, sunlight, for example, I've already said the spectrum looks like that. And the sun, like most other stars, as we understand, um, uh, the, the spectrum of it is apart from the absorption lines um, due to the atmosphere of the stars, um, are governed by the temperature of the star. So anything with a temperature will give you a spectrum, what we call black body spectrum. Okay. 
Okay. And in fact, here we are. So the spectrum for something that is really hot, 7,500 kelvins, compared to something that is um, 6,000 kelvins like the sun, um, and 4,500 kelvins uh, for a star that is cooler. So you can see that um, uh, the sun is going to be uh, bluer than a star that's cooler, but redder than a star that is hotter. Okay. Um, so that brings us to the question of why are there no green stars? Because we see blue stars, we see red stars, we see white stars, but you don't see green stars. Can we take a guess, given what I've just told you about uh, how do you get colour? Why that is the case? Anybody? Temperature. Temperature, okay. So, for example, uh, you mean there are no stars with a temperature corresponding to green? green. Well, that's not true because look okay. at this one, 6,000 Kelvin, it peaks in the green region, which is like the sun, right? So why, why is the sun not green? Is there, is there a possibility that, uh, that the atmosphere could be, could be, could be uh, modulating uh, particularly uh, uh, the uh, angle of the incident of the sun's light into the atmosphere. That could Some be a, um, a component, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, but that would be the same for all stars, right? Um, that is not the main reason here. Yeah, that is, you know, a modifying component, but it's not the main reason because that would happen to um, blue stars, red stars, and so on, right? So, and any other guess? Yes? Is it because you said if you add up all the colours, you get white? You add up all the colours, you get... what Newton saw, right? So that you split sunlight and it, you know, white light goes into all those colours, so you put them back together again. And even though it's peaked on green, you add them all together, because you're not, you're seeing the whole width, right? And so by combining them, okay. that becomes yes, white. Yes, yes, you, you're, you're, you're very close to it. Okay. Okay, that, 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 that is the crux of the, the matter. Okay. But, um, why do we have blue stars then? We can make the same argument. No? You, you're losing some. <laughs> you've not got Sorry? the stuff. There's not the stuff to the left, right? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, 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 so the main point of it is that yes, it peaks in the green, but unfortunately, because the spectral shape is so broad, had it been narrow, you'd see greenness. But because it's so broad, you're not going to see that because you know our color matching functions are these three. And uh, you know you're, you're, you're adding them up, and um, it so happens that when you put all that equations in, you actually won't see green stars. And in a hand waving argument we have here is simply because these spectrums are too broad here. Um, but the blue ones is that uh, well our eyes are not sensitive to anything outside this range, right? So um, then it's easy to add plus we our eyes, yeah. So, so, so that uh, uh, we ended up with something looking blue. And for the red, it's on the other edge, so you, you are fine as well. But the thing in the middle is much more difficult. You tend, you'd be more likely to see whiteness instead. OK, so that's uh, justification for this talk being an open down your pit. OK, back to Goethe. Um, so his famous, uh, well, his famous book, Theory of Colors, I was amazed, as I said, that I'd never read it properly. And I was amazed when I was reading it how <coughs> it really is a thesis. He, what a broad range uh, about color theory he had covered. Um, he basically divided color to three types of color. The physiological, uh, the physical, the chemical. And uh, there is another section on color and moral association. So I group that into the class of psychological effects. Okay. So, um, and that is actually the uh, uh, the uh, color wheel he, he he put in in his book. Um, so let's look at some of these. I'm not going to cover much of, uh, of uh, the chemical colors because the, the chemical color basically is. He's uh, spoken to people who are dyers, and how do they dye, uh, dye something of a certain color, how they mix the color, different color dyes, and so on. And he also, because he also studied mineralogy himself, and uh, he was very interested in the color of different minerals. He collected lots of minerals, uh, you know, it's almost like a museum he had. 
And he was also interested in plants because I told you earlier on, after his first trip in Italy, he came back and he wrote this book about um, different plants uh, and metamorphosis of plants. And then he also studied the color uh, of insects, fish, and birds. And in fact, today we'll know that some of these uh, actually are in the category of physical color. Because some of it is iridescence, has nothing to do with pigments, it's just interference effects. Actually, I, I saw, actually, all the great people have been interested in color and so on. And uh, a number of years ago, when I went to visit my colleague at uh, uh, the uh, uh, Raman uh, Research Institute. Um, Raman was a Nobel laureate, uh, famous for the um, uh, Raman spectroscopy. And uh, there was a museum, uh, this is in ba Bangalore, India. And uh, there was a museum there in the Raman Research Institute and with Raman's collections of minerals. And uh, he was looking at fluorescence effects, and so, so, so they had lots of crops in this place of fluorescence of minerals. And also, he had lots of butterflies collections and uh, various different kinds of butterflies and some of them are iridescent the other ones are some of the others are actually real pigmented ones um, uh, and then he also collected lots of ancient uh, Indian musical instruments I was interested in that and it was interesting that Goethe in his book also had a chapter about the relationship between color and the various different disciplines including music where he was talking about Color, there's harmony, music, there's harmony, and there's a link of that. I mean, that, you know, came from Aristotle originally. And uh, so I am I'm, uh, going on a bit about the uh, chemical colors because I'm not going to go into details of that. And uh, uh, what I will concentrate on physiological and physical here. And, uh, I, um, okay. Uh, this, I just I don't really want you to read this, it's a bit too long to change my mind about actually <laughs> reading it out to you because we don't have enough time. So this is a book I told you earlier on. It was somebody's PhD thesis. And, um, uh, Danny Sepper is now a professor in the um, university in, uh, in the US. Um, and his thesis in the 1980s was Goethe contra Newton. He looked in details of the reasons why uh, there was this, uh, Goethe was so, um, so against Newton, uh, and I'll show you some paragraph which is quite interesting. Um, part of the problem is that they're not working in the same disciplines. Um, so it, it, it's something actually I find often happens uh, when I talk to friends in arts and humanities. Now we'll argue about something, and then soon we realize this is just like going around in circles. Why? Because our definitions are different. And I had to go back and say, let's redefine what we're talking about. When I say this, I, I, I mean something different from when you say the same thing. Uh, the words mean different things. Um, and, uh, and so on. So I think that part of the problem is, is, is that it's not so much that Goethe is wrong, Newton is right, um, but they were talking about different things. Even they, they couldn't even agree, perhaps, on the definition of what theory means. Um, so, to go to what Syria means is probably the ancient, well, he's coming from the humanities side, whereas Newton, uh, his understanding is more like, uh, you know, you have a theory, you, you, you have to have this uh, experiment, uh, crucial experiment to uh, prove it right or wrong, and such. So, whereas Goethe was perhaps, you know, as suggested by this guy, that uh, it is not so much the mathematical modeling, but perhaps uh, the meaning of the ancient Greek word theory, which um, uh, was the activity of the spectator. So Goethe, uh, uh, in this book, was uh, divided this book into many, many experiments he did on color. And he described the phenomenon, and he actually did not theorize, as we understand the word of, of um, theorizing. Okay, now, what I like, is I thought this was fun, because um, uh, this is a whole bit of the slagging off Newton, uh, down by Goethe, <laughs> and um, in fact, Charles Eastlake, in his translations, had gotten rid of the worst part of it, because he thought if he put that in, nobody would want to read this book, especially for the English audience, who would think Newton is the greatest scientist ever, so how could anybody say such awful things about him? Right, so uh, here we are, he said that um, uh, in the second part, this is an extract from the preface, uh, we examine 
the Newtonian theory, a theory which, by its ascendancy and consideration, had hitherto impeded a free inquiry into the phenomena of comets. Uh, we combat that hypothesis, for although it is no longer found available, it still retains a traditional authority in the world. Um, so, its real relations to its subject will require to be plainly pointed out. The old errors must be cleared away. If the theory of colors is not still to remain uh, in the rear of so many other better investigated departments of natural science. Um, so that's. Uh, ah, then he says that since, however, the second part of my work may appear somewhat dry as regards its matter and perhaps too vehement and excited in its manner. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, okay. And then here he said, but it was impossible to write or even to prepare the way for a history of the theory of colors while the Newtonian theory existed. For no aristocratic presumption has ever looked down on those who were not of this order with such intolerable arrogance um, as that betrayed by the Newtonian school in deciding on all that has, had been done in earlier times and all that was done around it. With disgust and indignation, we find Priestley in his history of optics, like many before and after him, dating colors from the epoch of a decomposed ray of light, or what it pretended to be so, um, and so on. So he's very angry. And then this bit I thought it might be interesting for uh, some of our physics students, perhaps. Uh, so here he made some uh, remarks about mathematicians and experiments. Uh, another way of slagging of Newton. Um, in looking at a little further around us, we are not without <coughs> fears that we may fail to satisfy another class of scientific men. Um, by an extraordinary combination of circumstances, a series of colors has been drawn into the province and before the tribunal of the mathematicians, a, tri a tribunal to which it cannot be said to be amenable. This was owing to its affinity with the other laws of vision, which the mathematician was legitimately called upon to treat. It was owing again to another circumstance. A great mathematician having investigated theory of colors and having been mistaken in the observations of the, as an experimentalist, he employed the whole force of his talent to give consistency to this mistake. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then that was mathematicians and experiments. Beware when my mathematician is doing experiment. <laughs> he should not be too carried away. He should remember he's a mathematician, is what he was trying to say. But then I don't know about poets doing experiments, right? <laughs> um, so then he says something about serious and experimentalists, right? To the practical man, to the dyer, on the other hand, our labor must be altogether acceptable. For it was precisely those who reflected on the facts resulting from the operations of dying who were the least satisfied with the old theory, that's Newton's theory. Um, they were the first who perceived the insufficiency of the Newtonian doctrine. The conclusions of men are very different according to the mode in which they approach a science or branch of knowledge, from which side, through which door they enter. So he realizes that there is a difference in approach to a subject. Um, I myself found that in, uh, in uh, some of the um, uh, it was, uh, collaborative projects we do. We physicists approach a problem totally differently from uh, a discipline like engineering, which is very close, you think. But we approach it differently, even though we might both make the instrument work or solve the problem, but the approach is different. Um, and so uh, Goethe is aware of it. Um, the liter uh, literally practical man, the man, um, uh, the manufacturer whose attention is constantly and forcibly called to the facts which occur under his eye, who experiences benefit or detriment from the application of his convictions, to whom loss of time and money is not indifferent, who is desirous of advancing, who aims at equaling or surpassing what others have accomplished. Such a person feels the unsoundness and erroneousness of a theory much sooner than the men of letters in whose eyes words consecrated by authority are at least equivalent to solid coin. Okay? <laughs> then the mathematician whose formula always remains infallible, even though the foundation on which it is constructed may not square with it. So, uh, something about, so you might think that these days uh, academics are told to work with industry. So, <laughs> that might be a justification. So, uh, Goethe has already thought about it, so that might be important. 
the applied side, the practical side of science is important. Okay, now, I don't know if that's going to work or not. It might be too big. But um, according to uh, uh, Goethe, that, uh, if you look at these two, do you see the, the circle in the middle, the dark one and the, and, the, and the white one? Are they the same size or maybe one slightly bigger than the other one? Maybe it's, yeah, it's quite a big projector here. <laughs> These are not quite the same. But anyway, apparently, Ky uh, another justification for being open dome event, uh, Kaiko Brown remarked that the moon in conjunction, the darker state, appears about a fifth part smaller than when in opposition, the bright full state. The first crescent appears. Uh, to belong to a larger disk than the remaining dark portion, which can sometimes be distinguished in the period of the new moon. And then Goethe said, black dresses make people appear smaller than light ones, which is why if you want to look nice and look slim, you might wear black. And anyway, so if you can read Latin, you can read what Kapler said. I don't read Latin, so I have no idea why he thought it was beautiful. But, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, um, that's the so so there is illusions of the size of the object depending on whether they are black or white. The bit about black dresses, I think you all know about from experience. Don't you? So therefore, I don't need that to convince you of the fact. <laughs> um, okay, now the next bit is I'm going to show you about some color illusions here. Uh, I'm going to turn lights off here. So, there are two squares, they are painted the same colour, right? Now, I change the background, are they the same anymore? No, they're totally different. So, it's, so we judge colour not just by uh, what the spectrum of these two objects are, it's actually by the surrounding as well. So, as a physicist, you might go uh, and with your spectrometer and measure the spectrum of this bit and the spectrum of that bit, you'll find them exactly the same. But our eyes are not spectrometers, our eyes are not physical instruments. And so this is a point. So even though Newton had explained everything uh, through physics, but reality is the eye is an organ that human beings have, which is different from something that, you know, a, a spectrometer in a lab. It is affected by a lot of things because, because you know, the sensations will, will be passed to um, the brain and the brain processes the information. And so when you see the background being different, you will see these two appearing different in color. <coughs> and which might also make me think that a lot of the early experiments, um, you know, looking at color, how do they judge about things? They, they, you have to separate the two very clearly, the physical color and uh, the, you know, the, the sensation of our eye are quite different. If you study the physical part of things, perhaps you shouldn't use the eye to make judgments because our eyes can be fooled. Then you perhaps you should use a, a spectrometer or a detector, a physical detector. Okay, another example, in fact a background as well. You have, you know, these two, okay, if you can concentrate on the middle of here, you know, you focus here, do you feel that these two bars are don't look left and right, but concentrate in the middle. Do you feel these two bars are roughly the same color? Mm -hmm. the bar? Yeah. But now, if I do the same here, you see that the contrast is huge. Mm -hmm. See, I've linked them together, and then you immediately find they are different. Mm -hmm. And in fact, these two, this is just that, and that is that. Mm -hmm. But you see the color contrast within here is probably stronger than mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Joseph Erber's book. He's an um, uh, art teacher, and he, um, he has done a lot of these fun things. Now again, two squares, they are of different color. Okay. Now, I put a background there, and now they're looking like they're much more similar in color. Yeah? Um, in <coughs> fact, they are these two different colors. Again, this is called Bezor effect, but a similar sort of idea. You have this brick wall, but in the masonry here is white, and in this case, it's um, black. And these look much redder than these, much more saturated red than these ones, right? Mm. Okay. But in fact, the red bricks are the same. What I've done 
here is that I've covered everything up and just left with two bricks for the two walls. And they look the same down. So you, you, you know that I'm not fully right. <laughs> so I did make a copy of this slide and then just covered up the rest and left with this. Okay. So, and now after image, what I'd like you to do is to focus out here for maybe 20, 30 seconds. You're ready focus on this and then after a while so that you after a while you move over here your eyes over here to look okay but you have to focus on this for a while and then move over what do you see yes that's right you see jesus <laughs> so everybody got that you want a bit more time to do that Okay, give me some, uh, a little bit more time to do this. I think the longer you stare at it, the more you see that. Okay. And now, uh, this other one involving color. What I'd like you to do is focus here. You don't have to focus for too long here. And then, you know, you know, focus on this dot. And then you move it over there and focus on that dot. What do you see? Jesus. Yeah? So you see the complement of that being yellow. Right? <coughs> That's to do with the fact that uh, your, your receptor that's sensitive to, 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 to the yellow color here gets, uh, gets tired. And so when you move over there, they don't work as sensitively as other parts of the So again, it shows that our eyes are not simple instruments. You can say they're not perfect, or you can say they're marvelous. <coughs> now, I have a few more to show you. That's actually good fun, but it depends on how quickly I can launch it on the web. I have to keep on doing that. Okay, this Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Much, pre no. much prettier than this picture, right? Okay, so I'll give you some, a bit more time. Oh, is that because... You see, some people can see it much better than others. Because it's not right now. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'll try left. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you're yeah. here. You have to, yeah, oh, to look at right. <laughs> Oh, that's spooky. <laughs> okay, now you believe. Some people are seeing it. Just, yeah, just have to try harder. Uh, <laughs> uh, a bit, a bit. But clear. It's too much light on the screen. I'm getting contrast. Are you getting it? I can't get it. It's yeah. really... No. Maybe you're in the wrong position. Yeah. I thought yeah. she's kind of yeah. getting it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you know, yeah. yes, it's almost, it's almost <laughs> like Liz Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. You know, with dark eyes and dark hair. There you go. Yeah. 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 Well, it's gone now. You have to concentrate much better <laughs> on this yeah. before you move over there and put it to work. <laughs> anyway, there's a web page there. You can go and play with it at home. It worked quite well for me when I was looking at the computer screen. I got it. What's like a young Liz Taylor? Yeah. 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 Like you. Yeah. Okay, right. We can move on. Um, ah, this one is also a good one to uh, look at. Right. So, um, let me turn that again. You know, and make It's good illusion. It's cool. It's pretty if you look at it on the computer yeah. screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't need to turn those. <coughs> I think it's better. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> A and B, look at these two. One is grey, one is, uh, Light, very light to grey, yeah? Yeah. Mm. But in fact, I'm going to tell you that A and B are the same colour. Mm. Because that's the colour of what you see in A, yeah? If I move it over here, it's the same colour as B. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not what you think it is, right? <laughs> so, this is different from that because that's in the shadow of this. So that's quite a famous, uh, a famous uh, uh, colour and uh, illusion. It's again something to do with uh, um, the uh, background you're looking at and, and shadows and such. Ah, this one is excellent. <laughs> this screen, right? Concentrate on the cross. You should see a few things happening. Okay, wait, let me just uh, stop it here. Okay, concentrate on the cross, stare at it, you should see all kinds of things happening. First, you have green. Disappearing. They're disappearing. Oh. And then the green dots start to eat the purple dots, and you would end up with no purple dots at all. The green dots. So you blink. <laughs> you have to really concentrate and focus on it. Yes. You see that whole process? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Pac Man Illusion. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so you've all seen it. <laughs> Again, it's on the web. If you look up Pac-Man Illusion, you'll find it. 
Okay, another one. Herman Grimm. Well, that's quite easy to see, right? Can you start to see these? Uh, in fact, there, there's nothing, but you see the, these vertex. Have you stuck mm -hmm. in there? Mm -hmm. And this one. Oh, cool. It's quite annoying. You can't look at that for too long. That's right, yeah. Okay, so that's enough of uh, the... Um, uh, <laughs> Oops, what did I do? So that was all about physiological color. But then he classed another set into um, what he called pathological color. That is, for example, if somebody's colorblind. Now this, uh, I, I'm lucky to be able to show you some props here. Uh, that is, a few years ago, in 2009, I had an exhibition in the Bonington Gallery uh, called um, Seeing the Light was the name of the exhibition, where I collaborated with two artist friend of, friends of mine to put up this uh, uh, exhibition which demonstrates how light and color uh, interact with each other. And it so happens one of my artist friends had on this occasion confessed to me that he's actually colorblind. You know, if you're an artist, you wouldn't want people to know that. Right? <laughs> but he confessed to me he's colorblind, and therefore he's going to make this, this exhibition even more interesting. Um, because he can paint for us what the colorblind person might be seeing. Well, not quite. You can never do that, right? Um, but uh, uh, interestingly enough, despite being red, green, colorblind, he's able to teach students how to mix color. Okay? And, uh, well, in fact, uh, the trick is the following. Well, first of all, this is a painting he did of still life in his house, okay? And uh, without anybody helping him. And then he painted another one with somebody telling him, no, 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 you got the color wrong, and no, no, no. And then he got it right, and somebody who is not colorblind is able to tell his son, for example, told him, okay, this looks like what we, I'm seeing in front of me now. Okay, so these are the two paintings he made. So that give you an idea of what goes wrong mm -hmm. because of being colorblind. And he said that he would not make, uh, well, the, the, the thing is with colorblind people, he told me that they are much more capable of seeing the different grades, shades of gray than we are. We are less sensitive than they are. So in fact, he took a picture of these two paintings and then uh, uh, made a monochrome version of them. And you can see that uh, when you see it in grayscale, these two paintings look the same. Uh, and I'd also like to show you this. This is, uh, oops. <laughs> Uh, can you see that? Or maybe I'll bring it to the middle. These are the uh, color patches that um, he had. So the, this row is painted by his student, who is not colorblind. And that's him painting it, okay, without knowing what's going on. And student mix and his. So, uh, Normal <coughs> Asian person, colorblind person, normal Asian, colorblind. And if you look at these, you might get some idea of what is his red, green, colorblind. And then if you look up here, these are, uh, so he took again a grayscale picture, and you can see that he could match, he sees the grayscale very clearly, so he won't make a mistake there. Um, but the actual color, you would get that wrong. And uh, then he, he said that the way he, what he can, the reason why he's able to teach how to mix color and color right is that, well, there's a species he can cheat on, that is the um, tube of paint labels it what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's not the, the only thing. That's only the component. You've got to mix color, right? Mm -hmm. 
So then he can mix it according to color theory. He knows that if you mix this and that, he'll get what color. And then all he needs to do is to use his ability in judging the grayscale to get it exactly right. So he can actually mix it better, according to him. Than, <laughs> than uh, somebody who has no more vision because he can get the grayscales exactly right. Um, and so a bit of uh, theory uh, and knowledge and the fact that he can look at the tubes which tells him what paint it is means that he can do that. Okay, now something about physical color. Again, I chose the particular topics that Goethe talked about that I have examples of. Uh, in the lab. Uh, so he, because he was interested in art, right? So I don't know whether that shows better or that picture, but we'll try both. He was interested in art, and uh, so one thing he noticed was that if you have a painting that is varnished, it has a different color effect. Um, if you varnish a painting, uh, it'll make the color more saturated. And this is, uh, I hope you can see that at the top here, um, there's two patches, that's darker, and in the middle there is uh, the uh, blue. Yeah? And so these two patches have been varnished, in the middle it hasn't been varnished, that's uh, the blue sky. Um, so, so, so the effect, what is happening is that, uh, yeah, I'll show it, see if it works better on the screen. Yeah, so you can see that actually quite well. So these two patches have been varnished in between heaven and this part has been, that's all the blue sky. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that essentially it's because the paint surface um, has a certain roughness. Okay. And then by varnishing it, you're leveling the roughness. And by doing so, basically the varnish is acting as an optical element. And uh, you, um, you end up, well, I, for the ones who are interested in the details, I can explain in more detail how that works. But uh, essentially, <coughs> the reason is that the paint surface has a certain roughness, and by applying varnish on it, it fills, fills the holes, and therefore you end up with the final surface being rather smooth. And uh, therefore, uh, if, you, if you look at a painting, it will look uh, darker and more saturated. It's a, it's a bit like if you have a newspaper, and if it's wet, uh, then uh, you, you can see through and see to the other side of the writing as well. Um, again, that is because the newspaper is porous. If you have a liquid going through it, it fills up the, the pores in there. Um, so <coughs> that's all some things that physics can explain. Physics cannot explain what I've shown you earlier on. Um, and then the other thing is metamory. And, uh, <coughs> metamorism uh, is essentially, well, you all know about this probably. If you go to a shop and then you say, OK, I'm wearing a, a shirt and I want a pair of trousers, I'll go with the shirt. Okay? Sometimes because the lighting in the shop is no good and because of the fabric you know, that made the trousers are, in a certain way, that you might find when you walk out out of the shop in daylight, oh dear, they clash. <laughs> you know? So it's always very important to, when you're buying clothes to go outside the shop in daylight to check if it's still okay. <laughs> you know? um, so that is uh, what's called metamorism. In other words, two, um, two things that appear to have the same color in, under one lighting condition, but it would have a different color under a different lighting. I'm going to demonstrate this to you. Um, this is a tile from uh, National Physical Laboratory. What color is it at the moment? Like a pinkish yeah. sort of color. Okay. Light and pink. Now? Oh, one. Yeah. 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 There is a difference. Okay, hmm. so this particular tile is made by the National Physical Laboratory and it's a, a holmium uh, ceramic tile. And what happens is that, in fact, the uh, reflection and absorption properties of this tile is such that uh, um, the, it, uh, it preferentially um, 
reflects in a certain, uh, at the same position as some of the narrow lines of fluorescent light you have here. So that essentiates certain features. So, and that happen to be features that's, uh, that are either very sensitive to, and so it completely changes the color that you see. So it's because this yellow light I'm shining is a normal tungsten light, a yellow light with very smooth spectrum, where these lights and also daylight have a special peak, uh, certain peaks in the spectrum. That's why. So again, it's illustrating. So this is not an illusion, actually. This is real, because it's illustrating what a uh, different spectrum of light can do to the appearance. It seems to be illusion, but it is real. And I can use <coughs> instrument to measure it and prove to you mathematically and everything it is how it should be. Um, now, that comes to the conclusion. And I, I quite like this conclu concluding remarks uh, from uh, Goethe's book, uh, Theory of Color. Partly because, uh, you know, people come to open derby events, they are perhaps uh, call yourself amateur astronomers or whatever, right? And so, Goethe felt uh, that he needed to justify uh, why, uh, how, why it is that he can write a book like this. What can a man accomplish? Uh, uh, what can a man accom uh, accomplish who cannot devote his whole life to scientific pursuits? What can he perform as a temporary guest on an estate not his own, for the advantage of the proprietor? Um, so, the man of science has every motive to be still more in, uh, indulgent since the amateur here is capable of contributing what may be satisfactory and useful. The sciences depend much more on experiment than art. And for mere experiment, many a uh, votary is qualified. This is why, for example, in astronomy, they have pre uh, you know everybody looking for um, um, asteroids or whatever <laughs> sometimes, um, and events uh, um, of uh, for variable stars, and sometimes amateurs can contribute, including classifying galaxies. So scientific results are arrived at by many means and cannot dispense with many hands, many hands. This is very true for amateur astronomers. Um, science may be communicated, the treasure may be inherited, and what is acquired by one may be appropriated by many. And no one perhaps ought to be reluctant to offer his contributions. That. How much do we not owe to accident, to mere uh, practice, to momentary observation? That's very true for astronomy, like, for example, Stephen Right. All who are endowed only with habits of attention, women, children, are capable of communicating, uh, <coughs> communicating the true remarks. Um, I'm very pleased that you mentioned women. That is why I'm standing in front of you <laughs> to talk about things. Um, and then he said, he who has observed science and its progress with an unprejudiced eye might even ask whether it is desirable that so many occupations and aims go allied to each other should be united in one person, and whether it would not be more suitable for the limited powers <coughs> of human mind to distinguish, for example, the investigator and the inventor, from whom, uh, uh, for whom, uh, for, for him who employs and applies the result of experiment. Astronomers who devote themselves to the observation of the heavens and the discovery um, or enumeration of stars have in modern times formed to a certain extent a distinct class from those who calculate the orbits consider the universe in its connection and more accurately define its laws. The history of the doctrine of colors will often lead us back to these considerations. So on that note, I shall leave you. And you, uh, you can see that uh, yeah, it is easy. So what he's trying to say is that perhaps we should specialize. But in other pa passages, he also talks about people should collaborate, specialize and collaborate. People who are, are more into calculations and theory more into observations and experiments. I guess that's what he's on, his observations. Um, okay, well, I wanted to also say that he's not the only point who <coughs> contributed to physical science. Another point is Edgar Allan Poe, because he was the one who actually um, gave a correct interpretation of the paradox, that is, why is it nice stuff, not nice stuff. I'm not here to talk about that paradox itself, but I've just borrowed this slide from my first year lecture. And um, um, Edgar Allan Poe had pointed out um, quite correctly uh, that uh, um, 
we could comprehend the voids which our telescope find in numerous directions would be by supposing the distance of the invisible background so immense that no ray from it has yet been able to reach at all. So he realized it takes time for light to reach us from a distant universe, for example. So um, I don't want to go into details of Albert's paradox. I just want to say that um, Goethe is not the only poet who has contributed to science. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so for the reading, I've given you uh, three books there that if you wish to look into, and um, that's it for me. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Haida, for that very uh, colourful and uh, <laughs> illuminating uh, talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Is yeah. there any possibility that, that, that ozone in the atmosphere could be, absor could be absorbing certain colours coming from stars? As, it, as the light penetrates the ozone layer, it, it could be take the ozone, it's, it's an it's a oxygen, free yes. oxygen yes. atoms absorbing it highly. Uh, well, I don't think that is going to be a significant effect, but you will, for example, when we do observations, we take, a, let's say, a spectrum for a star, usually what we have to do is to subtract the night sky contribution. So you move away from the star, take another measurement, the same amount of time, and subtract it out. So if Ozone had done that, hopefully we We see lots of uh, sky, uh, space photos from the Hubble, Hubble telescope. Mm -hmm. um, why does NASA insist on colouring everything with, which is <laughs> not? <laughs> that's a, that, that's, that's a actually a very good question. Scientifically, I personally find it's better not to have them coloured. Grayscale gives you far more information, partly because I can tell many more gray, you know, um, many uh, much more in grayscale in colour, and also colour confuses. So is that twice as bright as that or not? You can't tell when one is red and the other one is blue. And, uh, um, but I think uh, places like NASA, they are really into outreach. And I think that a colouring is in that could attract the general public more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, what's actually, that's very interesting it's is that not long ago, I was it's talking to one of my biology uh, colleagues and uh, I was talking about this particular new imaging technique we have that can give you whatever, whatever. And uh, I was showing him a grayscale image, which is the raw image coming out. And it has all the information that is there. And he was not happy. Mm -hmm. I said, well, with these other techniques, I see color. Mm -hmm. And yours don't. And the particular technique he mentioned, I knew it wasn't true color he was seeing. Mm -hmm. It was grayscale that, you know, you just apply some false color to it to make it uh, more uh, pretty. You know, in, in, in scientific world, you also do that. Um, I, I don't know, maybe because people want to delineate certain layers much more uh, clearly for the tissue or whatever. They do that. But then you lose a lot of information for doing that as well. So even, uh, you know, scientists can be fooled by that as well. You know. sure. So I really do not like that kind of practice. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> You, you mentioned something about, at the beginning about colour and also music. I mean, I, I've heard this, I don't know yeah. whether this off topic a little bit, but Newton always said there was kind of seven colours in the rainbow. Because there were seven, <laughs> is it because there were seven notes in an octave? I and mean, he kind of, because you look at a rainbow, right? No one can ever distinguish indigo and violet. You're right, it's the kind of the purpley bit at the end. Is, um, have you, is, I'm glad you brought this up. Actually, that's a myth. Newton never, ne well, um, according to uh, this guy, he who has studied very carefully uh, okay. the original sources of what Newton had written mm -hmm. and what Goethe had written. He said it's more the successors of Newton who had went on about seven colours, but Newton was not so specific of, about okay. it. If you okay. read carefully, he, he alluded to there could be more than seven. It's not mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. seven. Mm -hmm. It's just the easy way to talk about it. Okay. And presumably they picked the number seven is for harmony. 
yeah. Uh, yeah, to, yeah. to correspond with, uh, because there are lots of colors, mm -hmm. and you can just about convince yourself they're seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so that, that corresponds very much uh, with, with, with music. Yeah, okay. And, okay. Uh, for, um, and there's the, uh, everybody in the Western science tradition would have read Aristotle and so on, and they would have, uh, you know, be thinking about this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in those days. And these days, as scientists, we don't think about Aristotle anymore. We don't start from him. <laughs> no, but no, no. Back no. then, they did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we start from Newton. Yeah. <laughs>